Well, hello everyone. Thanks to all of you who are joining us today. My name is Dalia Spasova. I'm part of the developer marketing team here at Kong, and I would like to welcome all of you to our June Kong Gateway Online User Call. So today we have a very special presentation for you coming from Kat Morgan. She's a senior developer advocate here at Kong. And the topic for today's call is Kong Gateway Microservice Architecture. Um, and the end of the presentation, we will open it up for Q&A and discussion. Kat has also left some uh, Q&A pauses during the presentation. So you can leave your uh, questions in the Q&A or in the chat, if you'd like, during the presentation. Um, and yeah, you'll be also able to unmute yourself and ask questions if you'd like. So with that, I will hand it over to Kat to start the presentation. Go ahead, Kat. Thank you. Um, it's good to be here. And... Um, I haven't attended a user call before, so for anyone watching, if I break from your routine, just uh, bear with me and we'll do better in the future. Um, yes, I am Kat Morgan. I am a developer advocate with Kong. Uh, previously, before joining the DevRel team, I was working as a field engineer and consulting with customers on Kong builds and deployments in the real world. So a lot of what you'll see today uh, stems from that experience, lessons learned, and things that uh, we regularly saw uh, working with, with customers of Kong's different products in the field. So getting started, as far as today's agenda goes, um, we are going to be primarily focusing on what Kong looks like on Kubernetes. Um, and we're gonna be taking a microservice approach there We'll talk a little bit about the different options uh, for deploying Kong, some of the permutations, and what each of the different microservice components that make up the Kong Gateway product are, and how they kind of fit in a real-world use case. Um, that outcome example is that, that use case that should be fairly simple to see um, kind of the application. and. Uh, one of my uh, last customers that I worked with. So stay tuned. There are eight, there are three different releases or uh, modes <clears throat> of using Kong Gateway. So um, when it comes to sitting down and looking at the drawing board for determining what your outcome should end up looking like, how you're going, what problems you're aiming to solve, there are a number of different paths for how to reach that end goal of success. And we'll talk about how that those permutations can evolve based on your needs. So what are the different releases and modes of operation? First off, we have, of course, the open source Kong gateway that um, was originally developed, of course, as a um, solution in-house for uh, Mash Ape, Kong's uh, former company that Kong grew out of. Um, and then the pattern itself proved to be valuable outside of just the uh, Mash Ape use case. And that's when Kong was formed to productize the gateway and um, lead, led to all of the different microservice components that we actually get to look at today. So what actually comes in the open source product? Of course, in all use cases of Kong, you're going to have the core pieces, which are that proxy, uh, the data plane itself, um, powered by Nginx and Lua, and then your admin API, which is how you actually interface with your proxy data planes and configure them. Um, you can also bolt on the ingress controller if you're using Kubernetes. Um, it is optional, so you can use Kong in its classic deployment style uh, on Kubernetes without the ingress controller. If you have other ingress controllers or uh, other means of publishing your services, and then of course you can also use the free plugins that uh, extend Kong's capabilities or um, write your own. Um, now, once you flip over to the enterprise uh, distribution of Kong, that is a uh, fork that is maintained based on the upstream open source code base. 
And if you run the open source enterprise version, you get everything that's in uh, the open source release, as well as the admin GUI with the unlicensed uh, features that are enabled at that point. Um, once you uh, get a, a license, uh, if you're on a paid plan, we're not going to overemphasize the, um, the paid uh, pathway of Kong, uh, but we do want to just kind of illuminate in context what the open source components provide all the way through this story, uh, and then how that fits with the um, licensed components of Kong. So you'll see a, a little bit of both sides of that throughout this talk. Um, so in that enterprise paid version, you get access to all plugins. There are some plugins that are um, maintained uh, for our licensed customers. Um, we can look at that in a bit. Um, you get the option of setting up multiple workspaces. So in Kong, there are logical groupings of services, RBAC groups. So that's your role-based access. If you have different teams and you want to isolate them to different workspaces with perm uh, permissions specific to those sets of services or those sets of plugins, that's what Workspaces provides. Um, the open source and the enterprise free uh, release and mode of operation, you are constrained to one workspace. Um, the licensed version also enables vitals. So you'll have your mark, uh, monitoring and alerting based on those vitals. Um, that's when RBAC is enabled by default uh, if you set it in your values file. So the RBAC allows you to establish a kind of super admin. That's your super user that can see across all workspaces. Um, and allows you to set up teams and uh, so roles and groups and users and constrain them based on the different roles uh, that you define. The licensed version is also when you get access to the developer portal. Um, so that is where you can document and publish different API specs and um, explain their usage and show different examples of how to interact with those. So those are the different uh, levels of features in the Kong releases. There are also different permutations and platforms that Kong supports. So this is when we start diving into the web of po possibilities and options uh, that can be considered when you're using Kong. Of course, it was originally um, written for bare metal and virtual machine instances, and we still support that paradigm today. I did work with customers using that, and it can be valid use case depending on your organization's um, needs and production um, practices. Of course, we can also run what we're focusing on today, which is Kong on Kubernetes. And then you can also run it outside of Kubernetes in its containerized form in things like uh, different container uh, as a service platforms, your AWS ECS or Fargate. I did both of those, um, Azure Container Service, Docker Swarm, and so on. So um, additionally, we're not going to be getting into the scope of Kong Connect Cloud, but that is the hosted Kong platform, which is our own uh, a homegrown cloud Kong gateway platform. Now, we just covered several different scenarios um, for which Kong product you can choose and how many different ways there are for building and architecting your implementation solution. All of those choices can be navigated based on um, a balance of cost uh, integration, so how well fully featured it is, 
and effort, how much effort you have to put in or how much effort um, you might save by opting for some of the um, enhancements uh, that an entitlement provides or um, other types of professional services that Kong can offer to help um, augment the effort that you bring to the table towards that final solution. And of course, choose wisely. This is the, when it comes down to cost, um, every single path that you might want to take, whether it's with the enterprise licensed version or the open source version, um, is a completely valid journey towards uh, an, an end goal of success with the Kong product. Um, but there will be a cost associated. In the open source version, that might be a, a labor cost, a time cost, and a risk cost of handling outages or bugs and upgrades more individually and on your own, which is perfectly valid if your team is capable and, uh, and equipped to, main, to deploy that and maintain it over time. Um, and then there are benefits if you opt for some of the paid options um, for pre-built integration, uh, whether it's an OIDC plugin or leveraging the built-in RBAC or um, taking advantage of the portal and additional customizability. So um, in the open source version, you have all the ability to bring your own developer portal for documenting your APIs. You have the opportunity to roll your own RBAC. And um, of course, that is something that I do sometimes just to understand uh, what the open source capabilities are and how I need to augment those if I am working on my own stuff. Um, and the open source software fits a lot of use cases um, all by itself. So if you just want an ingress controller or you just need to set up some basic plugins for um, uh, different features that are common to API gateways, the open source can completely cover without too much additional effort. Um, but if you're looking for that enterprise feature where you're baked in with um, all of the uh, default per persistence integrations and um, controls over users and reporting metrics and things like that. That is when you have to measure how you balance cost and effort over time. So before we dive into the individual components and things like that, I did actually want to encourage anyone with questions to go ahead and speak up. If you um, are curious about the open source versus enterprise prize uh, general questions, I'm happy to answer some of those in chat and grab a drink. If we don't get any, I will continue. All right. So now we're going to dive into the component architecture. What? actually makes up the entire Kong Gateway stack. And that actually is a little bit more involved than what I originally could, uh, imagined when I uh, joined Kong over a year ago. So of course, like we said earlier, no matter what you're doing, you always have the Kong proxy, that core data plane, which handles the incoming requests and uh, transformations and upstream traffic. So you're always going to be talking about north and south traffic in a scenario where you're talking about a Kong gateway implementation. The data plane itself is that Nginx service, which handles all of those connections and, and traffic requests. Um, then, of course, there's the API with that, which is what configures the proxy. Uh, beyond just those two core pieces, you can attach, uh, like we said, the developer portal, the admin GUI, which is that web UI, the, the web manager for Kong Gateway. If you're interfacing with uh, a web UI 
point and click style. I do it all the time, uh, especially in pre-prod scenarios where I just want to test different things or debug something. And then um, the ingress controller, which is a stand-in, of course, for a human operator that is optionally configuring the Kong admin API with DEC, which is a standalone declarative configuration tool or configuring in the GUI, the ingress controller takes Kubernetes resources like ingress objects and the new gateway API objects. Um, also, there's a CRD for Kong plugins if you want to declaratively configure um, plugins and integrations with Kong. Um, that ingress controller will interpret those resources and call the admin API directly. So one question that I hear a lot is um, comes around to scaling. If they want to increase the capacity of Kong, um, you know, maybe you're overloading some pot, your data plane pods, what exactly are you scaling in a scenario where you have the admin API, the ingress controller, and the Kong proxy? You'll notice in this illustration that we are showing multiple Kong gateway data plane proxy pods, and that is the, the core piece at the center of this illustration. That is the component handling the traffic. So if you want to increase your traffic capacity, that is the component that you want to scale horizontally. You can scale it to um, tens or hundreds of pods. And so long as you have the load balancer capacity to handle that, you're going to see your capacity increase. Um, we can get into the Helm values here in a minute to show you affinity and anti-affinity where you might want to make sure that you only have one proxy service on each node in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, obviously, overloading a given node with dozens of pods may not uh, increase your capacity. So there are uh, measured ways of scaling like that, which are worth taking into consideration as you're deploying and building your Kong. Um, the ingress controller component, really, you only need one pod for that. Um, if you try to horizontally scale your ingress controller, you're going to be doubling, tripling, so on orders of magnitude, increasing the number of hits that you are uh, calling your Kubernetes API with. So as you could imagine, if uh, you are have a very uh, full cluster and you have a lot of different things hitting your Kubernetes API operators and so on. I have seen Kubernetes API um, exceed its capacity and become a bottleneck for the entire cluster. And once your API goes down, everything starts falling over itself. So the ingress controller is actually something you want to specifically avoid scaling. The admin API itself, if it's standalone, um, that is something that you can scale. Um, if you're looking, if you, if you see a lot of traffic from maybe several different developer teams hitting your admin API, you need to increase that capacity. Scaling it to two or three might make sense. Or if you're scheduling them in different availability zones and you want to make sure that there's you know no downtime between a pod dying and an availability zone outage, and traffic being able to reach another zone, that might make a lot of sense. Generally speaking, your users for the admin API are going to be mostly internal teams to your organization. So it might be different application teams, or it might be um, different administrators working on the Kong gateway. Um, but generally speaking, you're not going to see extremely high loads on the admin API itself. The different sources of load for the admin API can be those internal teams. It can also come from your data planes. If your data planes don't already have specific keys or values that they might be requested uh, to look up based on plugins that you've installed in your data plane. So on occasion, your data planes might do a pull against the admin API. That is not extremely common and only uh, occurs if you have a given plugin that is designed to uh, 
make an admin API icon lookup. Excuse me. Let's see. I do see your question. We'll get to that in a minute. So um, the other place that you might see admin API load come from is the developer portal. So that developer portal does call the admin API um, in some scenarios. It might not always, and in some configurations, it never will. Um, but if you have a plugin installed for your developer portal, which enables your developers to create um, authentication tokens against your admin API, that is one scenario where you should, would see maybe a small load also generated on the admin API by your developer portal. And then finally, your admin GUI uh, is going to be 100% reliant on the admin API for being able to look up what services you have, being able to um, identify the, the vitals traffic that you're seeing across your data planes if that's enabled. All functions of the admin GUI uh, result in your client calling, your client being the browser, calling the admin API directly. The admin GUI, again, that's kind of like the ingress controller. You're not going to see usually a significant need to scale it. You do not have any adverse uh, side effects from scaling it. The admin GUI does not call the Kubernetes API, for example. So scaling it is not going to degrade performance of anything else. Um, generally speaking, much like the availability, if you are aiming to avoid any downtime if an, if an availability zone outage occurs or something like that. Scaling it to two or three might make sense. Um, I honestly have never seen a scenario where it needed to scale beyond two for reasons of load on the uh, admin GUI itself. So um, that's another thing that having the microservice architecture approach to Kong really helps to manage is making sure you're not duplicating unnecessary overhead in your uh, deployment. So the um, one thing that I wanted to definitely illustrate today, and I don't have a diagram for this, but everything that you see as far as all of these components go can actually be deployed as its own Helm release where everything, all the, the proxy function, the developer portal function, the admin web UI, the admin API, the ingress controller, all of those things can live in one pod. Um, that's not the most um, Kubernetes native purest way of deploying Kong, but it might be valid if you're doing local testing or a pre-prod um, R&D effort just to get Kong running and with minimal impact to your cluster and minimal complexity, have your hands on all possible components uh, of Kong itself, and then decide perhaps from there what avenue you want to take for your final architecture. Um, for example, it might be perfectly reasonable to have your developer portal and your Kong admin web UI to uh, served both from the same pod, um, just because those are going to scale pretty similar to only you know two or three pods max. Your ingress controller, um, I like to always deploy my ingress controller as its own independent Helm release, um, especially if I'm working with an in, uh, a licensed uh, deployment of Kong, because. You, you're going to see that your ingress controller associates on a one-to-one -one basis with a workspace and becomes its own ingress class. So you might have your default ingress class uh, attached to your default workspace in Kong, or you might see um, another ingress class that is constrained to a specific Kubernetes uh, namespace and are back applied to that ingress resource, uh, ingress class, so that one application team might be constrained to one namespace in their Kubernetes cluster and associated with one workspace on the Kong, um, Kong gateway. Uh, 
Another thing to keep in mind, you, while you can distribute all of these pieces either across different um, non-Kubernetes virtual machines or bare metal hosts, you can, you will only ever have one set of data planes, fine print included. This rule completely goes out the window once you jump uh, to the discussion of the Connect Cloud, where you might see the Connect Cloud giving you one control plane to manage multiple different data planes that are completely independent, possibly in different clusters or in different uh, regions of the world entirely. Wrapping up that point, just want to make sure for everything that we are discussing today, we are talking about it in the scope of only having one data plane. So any different namespace, ingress controllers, any different workspaces, in the end, those things are feeding configuration to the admin API that pushes the exact same config down to all of your data plane proxies, regardless of how you have them scheduled on your cluster. All of those data plane proxies are going to be configured identically. Um, last thing that we haven't covered in this piece of the diagram is um, you'll see I have Redis and Auth0 as example plugins. So those plugins live on the data plane if you use them. Redis would possibly come in handy if you're looking at doing um, some, some types of credential uh, session management or rate limiting across multiple data planes. Usually I will lean back on rate limiting the uh, with the in-memory cache. So each pod of your data plane, each individual proxy will have its own independent memory. Um, so if you're rate limiting um, any given client, then um, what you'll see is it might hit its rate limit on one pod. If you, usually that session will be routed uh, to the same pod, if something happens that bounces that traffic to another pod, it will have a new rate limit applied and it might uh, start from a new counter, a fresh counter of zero on that other pod. If that is something you have to design uh, against, then that's when you might use Redis, for example, to maintain a common cache for rate limiting across all of your pods or a common cache for session handling and tracking authentication sessions across multiple pods. Auth0 is one example of an authentication provider. Um, there are a lot of different authentication providers that you can integrate with or um, use something like Dex or Keycloak where uh, you're going to be using those as a broker for a federated um, authentication strategy. But again, that is a plugin. And those plugins live um, in the Kong proxy itself. Um, there are dozens of other prep plugins. Of course, you can check out the uh, plugin um, hub to find out more about the ones that uh, we help publish. There are also community plugins, and you can write your own. Um, I'm sure we could get that into more of those details in another call. There are good, um, uh, I know last week Victor Gamov did a session about some of his favorite plugins. So you might go look that up. Um, but all in all, that should give you at least an idea of what pieces we have. Uh, in our microservices that make up Kong Gateway, as well as where the plugins work, what makes sense to scale. And I didn't get into it significantly, but you, if you're doing a stateful deployment of Kong um, that is not exclusively declarative via DEC or Kubernetes uh, resources, um, or if you're utilizing um, RBAC or any other plugins that require a stateful backing store, that's when a Postgres database um, be, uh, it adds as to the deployment as another dependency that might help your Kong deployment. Um, not shown here uh, is a cert manager. Cert manager can, of course, help with issuing individual specific certs for certain ingress resources or it can be used to 
issue the certificates that Kong requires, for example, between the admin API and the data plane proxies. If you do not deploy them all in a single Helm release and in a single pod, then you do have to come up with an MTLS scheme. And there are a couple of different ways to do that. I really like shared TLS when possible, um, where it's just one self-signed uh, cert and certificate key. And those are issued to a secret mounted into the gateway proxies and the admin API. And then they just mutually share that certificate to establish trust between those pods so that they can communicate over TLS uh, in the cluster itself. So cert manager could be another dependency. And there are a few others in odd cases, but those cover most scenarios that I've seen. So we're going to pause for questions again um, before we jump further into an example showing kind of an outcome that you can achieve. Um, and I know we have at least one question here. Let's read that. With the Kong provided Helm chart, the ingress controller seems to scale with the proxies. Is there a way to decouple them? Yes, that is a fantastic question. Um, actually, at the end of this, we can dive into some of the Helm chart values files that I've saved off. And we'll talk about what it looks like when you are decoupling those things and deploying them as their own individual separate releases. So hold that thought and we'll get into it very soon. Uh, are there any other questions? I am going to pause for another drink. Uh, feel free to pipe up with anything on your mind. All right, thank you for that question. Uh, it looks like we can go ahead and move on to example outcomes. So. We covered the fact that we have an open source and an enterprise release of Kong Gateway that you can run enterprise in free mode with an empty license or in licensed mode to get access to additional features of Kong. Um, we've covered the different deployment permutations for either deploying as a monolith containing all possible services or any mixture of those that you have uh, decided to use in your deployment and that it can live on many different platforms, um, whether it's in Kubernetes or outside of Kubernetes, there are many different ways. I've covered all of those things, including how to scale the right components of Kong, how far to scale different components of Kong and what plugins actually, what component the plugins live on. So once you've made a lot of those choices, what can you actually accomplish with Kong? And that's one thing that I'm going to take, um, a diagram that I used in a real world use case with one of my customers. Um, and this was actually really interesting to me. We had a fairly simple deployment of Kong. It was hybrid, meaning we deployed the data plane independent of the control plane. And we did use some pre-existing plugins, as well as custom writing our own small plugin to handle a really unique scenario. Basically, what happened is this customer was an upstream service provider. Their service was provided to um, third parties who were service providers to end users. The end users themselves never directly interacted with this customer's service. So what would happen is you would have two layers of um, identity to keep track of. You would have your end user identity, and then you would also have your um, third party, that end user service, which was a broker between this customer's service and the end user. So what, since we did not have any existing um, authentication plugins, which would maintain two sets of roles on any given request. What we did is we utilized our existing OIDC plugin. We implemented a Redis cache so that we could have a session which um, tracked 
sessions across all of the data planes as they scaled. And then we also wrote a plugin which would cache um, a second set of scopes requested from a custom API that the, cu the customer maintained. So the client would basically have their request come in, authenticate against uh, Auth0 using the uh, third-party credentials. And then it would also look up the client's um, individual ID with the uh, custom plugin. It was, I want to say, about a 300-line Lua plugin, and the lines are not complex or long. I was not familiar with writing Lua when I wrote this plugin, um, so I'm just going to say that it's actually a fairly easy language to pick up if you need to do some simple custom plugin writing. Um, but basically, this plugin would call a custom API to provide a second layer of roles and attributes and attach those to the packet as headers. And then we would run those headers through OPA to get a true false, um, a Boolean for allow or deny the continued uh, handling of those packets. OPA being open policy agent, that is, we talked about Postgres being a possible dependency, cert manager being a possible dependency. This is one example where you might see other dependencies in your cluster for uh, running Kong, including OPA. OPA is commonly used at the mesh layer, um, but we can also leverage that on the gateway uh, for applying rules to packets. <clears throat> Excuse me just a second. Sorry about that. And then um, what we were doing with that, this is, I mentioned there are different um, caching strategies. You can use Redis, which definitely makes sense for an authentication set session um, cache. There is also the memory cache. You can use a, the memory cache or the Redis cache for things like rate limiting. We use the memory cache for um, caching those additional headers that we were adding to packets before letting it continue on to OPA. So that memory cache, again, is constrained to each individual pod. Um, just a different view of that workflow. And I will be dropping up, sharing these uh, slides um, later on from um, drawing a blank. It will publish those. Figure out how to get those out to anyone who wants to see them. This is another uh, way of looking at that exact same flow, where you have the client coming in. It is checking Redis cache for authentication credentials or continuing on to cache new credentials. Um, it continues on with a custom plugin to pull the additional scopes and RBAC information from that custom API and caching those as well. Continues through OPA plugin to identify whether the packet has the right permissions to continue on and then drops back out and sends the response. Um, all right, so slide is mistitled. This is not final questions. We actually can continue on to take a look at some of the Helms values and things like that. Before I jump into Helms values, though, I will give you an opportunity to speak to any other questions or just ideas that might be on your mind that you want some feedback on. At this point, I've finished the um, agenda of the, the program, and we have about 15 minutes still to continue with general discussion. So I'm going to invite you to speak up or chat, uh, we will look at the decoupling, the ingress controller and the data plane and the admin API here in just a second. Um, and we'll look at that with Helm value specifically. All right, we have something here. <clears throat> 
Um, if you want to actually unmute and speak to this question, uh, we can engage that way if you like, or I will go ahead and read it out loud. Awesome. Okay, so we have a lot of good questions coming up. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start with Pratush. Um, apologies I, if I butchered your name. Um, so the first question, based on the organizational setups, every team manages its own Kong instance rather than a centralized repo. This is a two-part question. How can developer portal be helpful here to connect to multiple Kong instances to what is the best practice? Should there be only one centralized gateway instance for every team or a distributed gateway for every team and then managed by a single developer portal? Fantastic questions, and there are different ways to answer this. If you're using the open source version of Kong, you're going to be deploying just um, one Kong deployment per set of RBAC or constraints or cluster, right? So um, if you have a uh, app team A and app team B, and you're using the open source version and you want to isolate them from each other, you're going to have two totally separate sets of releases of Kong Gateway, and you're going to man manage them separately. Uh, if you are ut utilizing developer portal, at that point, I can assume you are running a licensed version of Kong. Most of the time, I am going to encourage you to only use one Kong deployment uh, uh, per cluster specifically. Um, and then I'm going to encourage you to separate app team A and app, app team B into different ingress classes, possibly, and different workspaces associated with those different ingress classes. So in that scenario, you would have two developer portals. Each developer portal is specific to its workspace. Because of this, I definitely encourage um, not just running hundreds of workspaces. That would be excessive to say the least. Um, you can document all of your APIs from multiple workspaces in one developer portal. So that is an option if you want to have a consolidated, consolidated presentation of your API documentation. Um, or one thing that I have seen is uh, we really benefited from having a public developer portal and an internal developer portal. Um, so you could publish your pub the public APIs and documentation with a public workspace, uh, for example, and give access even to third-party developers that might want to be able to issue their own authentication tokens for developing against certain APIs. Um, and then you would have your internal developer portal, which would cover all of your internal APIs that you might not want to uh, be publishing all of the documentation for, especially since a lot of those APIs won't even be publicly accessible. So um, just kind of summarizing how I would recommend approaching with a, uh, your, your workspace uh, organization um, with a licensed version of Kong, setting up a public and a private workspace and deploying the two different developer portals per workspace makes a lot of sense to me. You might have additional workspaces to a degree, like you might have a workspace for, um, say, administrator, platform administrator services that might not have a developer portal. You don't have to enable a developer portal on every workspace. Um, and I definitely have found a lot of value in having a workspace for the platform administrator team. For example, I <clears throat> commonly actually serve the admin API, the admin GUI, and developer portals through um, the Kong Gateway proxy itself. So I can have all of the, that traffic running through the same load balancer as, say, all of my internal services. Or in some cases, it's less recommended, but 
they can run through the same load balancer as all of your public traffic, right? And in those kinds of scenarios, um, having a dedicated workspace for uh, your Kong manager and Kong API especially that is not impacted uh, by, say, a bad authentication plugin configuration rolled out to your public or your internal workspace and ingress class, it, it keeps you from um, accidentally locking yourself out from your means of recovering from a mistake like that, which I've made, a mistake I've made many times. So not in protection yet, though. Fingers crossed. Um, and then let's see. Uh, moving on to Marcello, uh, any recommendations about DB lists versus Cassandra deployment? Yes. So important to note as of 2.7, I think, uh, don't quote me on that, uh, Cassandra as a um, backing store was deprecated. So now that we're on 2.8 and approaching the Kong 3.0 release, Keep in mind, Postgres is going to be the recommended and the only non-deprecated um, data store that you're going to want to back your cluster with. As far as DB list goes, DB list, um, in my opinion, is most applicable to the non-Kubernetes deployment or to the Kubernetes deployment where you are not using the Kong Ingress controller. I'll get into that in a second. It is also valuable to the open source uh, version of Kong. So if you are wanting to run Kong without the ingress controller and you're not using any of the um, enterprise features like the web UI or RBAC, then DBLIS is definitely um, a, a good consideration. Um, in To contrast it, if you're deploying to Kubernetes, you can do almost all of Kong configuration that you can do with the DBLIS uh, approach. Um, actually, I will describe the DBLIS is Kong, where you are configuring it without a database backend, and you're doing it declaratively through the admin API, commonly with DEC. Yeah, um, I have seen some customers write some admin API um, off it. Uh, configuration themselves um, that was just bespoke, but DEC is our own um, declarative admin API syntax that allows us to configure it without Kubernetes uh, or Kubernetes custom resource definitions. Um, a good reason to not mix and match Kong Manager and DBLIS or Kong ingress controller and DB list is because once you add more than one of those three into the mix, you can find yourself in a position where you have multiple possible sources of truth. And that is where everything is up for grabs when you want to invent new ways of crashing things and taking out prod, right? Especially if you um, are configuring a DB full Postgres backed um, Kong. In the event that you were to define the same service in uh, a deck configuration and apply that to a DB list and also have an ingress controller, there is potential that you could end up with a collision or duplication of, re of service resources. And just generally, we want to make sure that we don't design our cluster and Kong management um, implementation in such a way that could possibly lead us into that kind of a path. So if you want to use Kong ingress controller for some things and have an ingress class for your Kubernetes cluster, but you also have a workflow that utilizes DEC and DBLIS Kong um, in that kind of a scenario, which I have not actually seen a valid um, use case for, um, or any that we actually ran all the way to production with. Um, but for hypothetical argument's sake, if you did find yourself in that situation, I would say deploy two totally separate Kongs. Deploy your ingress controller uh, Kong 
for all of your ingress classes for your Kubernetes cluster that utilize Kong, and then separately deploy a, a second Kong that you manage DB lists with DEC without an ingress controller and probably without a Kong manager. If you're using any of the RBAC features of Kong, you absolutely have to have a, a database at that point. So um, at, at that point, running a deck configuration, in my opinion, um, especially if you're on Kubernetes, since you have that uh, stateful backend and you have ingress controller, um, I would be inclined to suggest that deck is an unnecessary a tool to add to your regular maintenance and configuration tool belt and would steer you instead towards configuring with um, the ingress controller custom C resources. So your, your plugin configuration with CRDs and your ingress and service uh, and gateway API now uh, is in beta, so give it a try. Um, with, with ingress resources. I hope I answered that. Um, it looks like we are getting short on time and I did promise to jump into some help values. So let's go ahead and jump in here and we'll cover those real quick. It should be pretty straightforward. We're actually going to start with the data plane and then we can jump to the admin API and then take a look at the ingress controller. If you're curious to see these things for yourself, they are published in no finished state whatsoever, but for your uh, for, for you to follow along, you're welcome to check them out at this link. Let's see, we're going to jump into the data plane. All right, so you can see here, this all, all of these are written for a local testing environment on um, kind. Kubernetes. So I only have a single node. And um, in this case, I can only scale to one because of that, because I am telling it to only schedule data planes, one per node in my Kubernetes cluster. You'll see a lot of these other features specifically set to enabled false. It's because I don't need to enable the um, cluster API that is running in the admin uh, the control plane helm file release. These I don't need to talk about. I can delete those. They stay as default. This enterprise we have enabled to true. Um, and you're going to set that to true whether you're running with if, if you're running Kong Enterprise in free mode or in licensed mode. So if you're running in free mode, you will also have this license secret. That license secret is just going to be an empty JSON string for free mode. Um, and then, of course, your real license if you're running the, the paid version of Kong, Kong Enterprise. Now, what I really want to go ahead and cover with you here, this end section is a little bit of a misnomer, in my opinion, just because what actually happens behind the scenes is in the Kong um, container, we have an entry point, which will look for all environment variables prefixed with uh, Kong underscore. And then it will take those environment variables and roll them up into what is a custom kong.conf at pod startup time. So if you change any of these end variables, you're going to roll your pods after you apply the Helm release. Or if you're using um, an IAC that'll roll those pods for you, this, this is why. This is one of the reasons why. Um, if you're running Kong on a virtual machine or um, bare metal, you'll see all of these things are associated with what you would configure in your Kong.conf if you are manually writing your configuration for that type of a deployment scenario. So it maps one-to-one -to, -one to your Kong.conf. Um, the image here. Okay, so this is a 2.8 release. And if you are deploying the open source version, you're just going to get the Kong image, not the Kong gateway image, just the Kong image. Kong gateway is the enterprise container image. So you'll see here that is where I'm actually telling it to go use the enterprise container. And if you're using your um, 
empty string JSON license for enterprise free mode, you're going to be using the enterprise com gateway container. Ingress controller, part of that decoupling conversation. When I deploy my data plane, I'm going to actually set my ingress controller to false because I'm going to enable ingress controller in its own Helm release somewhere else. Um, same for Kong Manager. So that's that web GUI. We're not deploying Kong Manager on the data plane. Um, doesn't make sense to scale it uh, along with the data plane. So you're going to set that to false. Migrations, we're handling migrations um, in with the control plane. So these are jobs, Kubernetes jobs, that maintain your database. If we update the schema of your database, there we will release um, jobs which will migrate your database to that new schema. Of course, the namespace is pretty familiar. Portal and portal API, these are the two components that make up the developer portal where you can document and publish those APIs specs that we talked about. And I'm um, going to come back to proxy here in just a second. Of course, you can see I set replicas to one. Um, because I am using my host port, port 80, I have to destroy my pod before I create a new one if I roll my pod. So that's why you see my rolling um, update strategy set to 100% make sure that Kubernetes destroys the pod, frees up the port before it schedules a new pod. Um, here in secret volumes, that's where I'm setting up my cluster cert, which is that shared MTLS cert that I used in this scenario. It was issued by cert manager. Um, proxy TLS is the secret where I issued my default proxy certificates that Kong uh, serves services through Kong. If you're using the ingress controller, can be configured to use certs dynamically created by something like Cert Manager that are specific to a given service uh, or ingress object. However, if you don't specify an ingress uh, certificate, it will default to the proxy TLS certificate. And then the control plane services, um, this has to do with where I provisioned like my Kong manager web UI uh, certificates and developer portal certificates. Um, setting resource limits should be a pretty routine Kubernetes idea. And then the last thing in this values file, we are at time. I'm going to go just a tad bit over and anyone who needs to can drop. Um, but this is where I actually set up the service. Um, for the proxy. And in my case, because I'm deploying locally on Kind, which doesn't have a load balancer and uh, uh, concept, I am just doing cluster IP and do, attaching that to my local host with host port. You would switch this to load balancer in most any other scenarios because you want to give the data plane as direct access uh, to that client request as possible. All right, I'm going to jump to control plane. We don't have to get into a lot here because we covered the basics already pretty well. We are enabling the admin API. And we're enabling an ingress for it. And we're enabling our cluster, which is where that uh, hybrid mode where you have a separate admin API and a separate data plane is where that is published. Um, cluster telemetry, that's part of the licensed feature that enables vitals. Um, we covered the enterprise basics, which is enabling enterprise, even if you're doing the uh, enterprise free mode and providing your license. If you have a license, then you can go on to enable portal. I'm enabling portal in its own Helm release. You can enable RBAC, that's where you get that uh, can set up your super admin user and things like SMTP and integration and vitals come along with that. Um, there are a lot of different things to set up for a DB full uh, Kong config, which is where you start seeing, um, for example, all of these keys for configuring your Postgres configuration, as well as certificates for your admin API, certificates for your um, 
developer portal and things like that, which are going to be loaded into the database. And then you'll see things like um, extra labels here, which I include on all of my individual releases. Again, I'm using the enterprise container and enabling manager. I enabled manager along with the control plane. Um, this is where your migration jobs occur and everything else is pretty well covered. We're not enabling portal here either. That's its own standalone. So let's go take a look at the ingress controller. Now you'll notice here, I actually have default controller and public controller. These are two different ingress classes in my deployment. And um, this is what it looks like. I'm going to show you we're disabling proxy, of course, again on this one, but we are enabling. Uh, where is my ingress? No, I'm on developer portal. I was wondering why that looked funny. There we go. OK, this is really, really simple. So the ingress controller standalone. Uh, piece is a really, really simple Helm va release values to publish. Um, this is the last thing I'm going to show today. We're enabling ingress controller. We are setting um, the image to the ingress controller image, and that is its own release schedule. And then we're telling it where to find the Kong admin API so it can configure Kong, as well as, um, let's see, we have the Kong workspace. This is what actually names my ingress class. So if I have default ingress class, I'm going to create ingress objects with for the default class. And you'll see that's different with the other um, ingress controller. You can go look at that yourself. I know I went over time. I hope you all got something out of today's call. Thank you for being part of the user call today. Great feedback or great questions provided. Um, I hope that leads to more questions for the future, and I hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Kat. Great presentation, and thank you, everyone, for joining. We hope to see you at our next events. Have a great evening, great day. See you soon.